being a paramedic. It was something that I always had set my heart on to do. Ambulance emergency. From ambulance, please. It's a child falling in a walk. We always have to be looking out for everyone. There's a lot of rest on our shoulders as the first people on scene at a lot of incidents. Right, OK, tell me exactly what happened. 17-year-old female gasping for breath. It's a humbling job. It also makes you appreciate how fortunate you've been in life. Whether you're in the islands, you know, the north of the city, your skills have to be good. It's a 26-year-old male is Serving a population of over 5 million, the Scottish Ambulance Service is unique. We need car RTC, no, mate. We'll arrive in literally five minutes. It covers one entire country. We've got a couple of guys on top of this Norwich. A vast and diverse landscape. I'm organising help for you now. Stay on the line. Oh my God. This series follows the men and women of the Scottish Ambulance Service on the front line, first on scene at medical emergencies, right across the nation. Probably the first time I've ever nearly cried at a job. I don't want to give people false hope. Keeping Scotland safe and alive. Just take your eyes open for us. Just let me know that you're all right. They are coming as fast as they can, all right? 265 on scene, over. This time, a mishap on Mull means an airlift to hospital. <laughs> A holidaymaker in Edinburgh is struggling to breathe. Coughing quite a lot recently, is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah. yeah, I thought I was going to die now, actually. A driving instructor in agony. Go and take a deep breath in. <sighs> needs emergency treatment. And a morning bike ride turns into a bit of a bloodbath. It's a pure hard man, isn't he? Ten thirty a.m. Scotland's charity air ambulance is being dispatched to a medical emergency. The destination, the Isle of Mull. On board are paramedics Wendy and JP. Scotland has 93 inhabited islands. The larger ones have hospitals, and many do have ambulances. But to reach the kind of definitive care provided on the mainland, the air ambulance is a vital resource. It's a huge lifeline, the, the air ambulances. You know, they're going back and forth, looking after their patients. Having the aircraft there to get patients back to the mainland is, is really, really crucial uh, for their uh, you know, well-being. The patient's location is in the far west of Mull, 55 minutes flying time from base. Pilot Sean will need to refuel to make the onward journey to hospital. Am I speaking out, Roger's running? Yeah. Then while you're giving the patient, I'll go and get the toilet over. Okay. Roger's running, then come back. Yeah, yeah. Cool. The decision to fuel up while the paramedics tend to the injured man will save valuable time. Fortunately, flying conditions are good, but this is the Inner Hebrides. There's no guarantee they'll stay that way. This is the challenges we get with uh, with working in Scotland. You know, we get major climates coming in. We get uh, in the hills, especially when there's when the clouds rise. We get a lot of precipitation, rain. So that's all in one day. Yeah, well, I'm quite excited. As the team approaches the location, more information comes through. Anyway, I just had a quick update from the scene. 
Pish had a left-sided puncture wound to the chest. Um, he fell about 8 to 10 foot. He has been given 20 milligrams of IM morphine. We are aware of your arrival time. More than 200 miles away in Aberdeen, paramedics Ewan and Alan are on the day shift. En route to a call, they are suddenly given a more urgent job. So we've been diverted to a different job now. It's a 68 year old male. Information we have is he has a liver infection and having pain in his stomach. The pain is being described as severe indigestion. So it could be cardiac. The patient is at a driving test centre, right on the other side of the city. Try the traffic. Oh, why is it so busy here? With few details to go on, the paramedics don't know how ill the patient is. But it sounds serious. Time to put the foot down. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> we almost absolutely scalded a pigeon. <laughs> like, are you braked? I'm like, duck. <laughs> you ducked. <laughs> I think we're both ducked. Yeah. <laughs> a short drive later, the paramedics reach the location. He appeared in pain when we arrived. So we just started our assessment. Where about is the pain exactly? Right across your stomach. Um, and you've had it sort of three times before in the past yeah. and it feels very similar. You can often tell when people are in a lot of pain, they're sort of quite tense. His pulse rate was up a wee bit, which is often a bit of an indicator that he's in pain as well. And after feeling his abdomen, he was very sore when we were sort of touching his upper epigastric region. And how's your health otherwise, apart from this sort of recurrent infection you uh, get? It's, it's not too bad. Uh, I want tablets for high blood pressure, mm -hmm. uh, uh, underactive thyroid, and um, uh, 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 high cholesterol. So I think what we'll do is we'll get you lying down, get your blood pressure and things checked, see about maybe getting a wee needle in your hand, getting some morphine into you. How does that sound? That sounds pretty good to me. But Bill, you pop yourself up here if you can. Loosen off your top. Um, we'll do an ECG as well, okay? Just, you, you. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just do all our checks and rule your heart out. And, yeah, okay. Just gonna lightly press in your stomach. If you just try and relax as much as you can. Feeling okay? Sore there. Is it like a gallstone you've got, or is it just... Well, I was diagnosed with a gallstone. And to check for the presence of further gallstones, Alan uses a test called Murphy's sign. It's where we sort of push in on their upper epigastric region, sort of just on the right side below their ribs, and we just get them, the patient to breathe in. It's all right, pal, just a little bit of pressure. Go and take a deep breath in. <sighs> Do it this side. Relax, just relax, just relax. And if they get a sort of sharp intake of pain in their upper epigastric region, it's often a, a sign of gallstones, um, as there's extra pressure on their gallbladder then when they're breathing in. Um, so it's a good indicator of that. So that's are good. To get Bill's pain under control, the crew prepare to administer morphine. Wee scratch coming up, Bill. Right. Just think we're in. We're just gonna flush some cold water through it. Uh -huh. Then get the morphine into you, okay? Oh, <laughs> it's good seeing that we are doing something for that patient and they're getting um, sort of a good relief from what we're giving them. Feels like we're doing our job then when we're when we're seeing an improvement in our patients. It always makes you feel good. Happy. Happy. I'll leave you to it. Good. You straighten this leg Hopefully for me. Hopefully he'll be somewhat happy by the time I get to hospital. So what do you do? Are you a tester or...? No, I'm a, a 
Let's stop there. Okay. Give you some more morphine. I think I've lost one to do Let's get your arm out if you pull your head. It's alright. I've seen grown men, you know, big burly men in tears with um, these colicky kind of stones, you know, uh, renal or kidney stones is, is very, very painful, or it appears that <laughs> this appears quite sore as well. Ah, your health has to come first, eh? That's it. Oh. Sorry, it's a bump. I never thought you'd be assessing my driving. I've had traffic cops and everything, you're like nervous. Like, I'm with patients, you know, in the back. They've travelled with the patient or whatever, you know, if it's been a drunk driver or something in this hospital, and you're like, totally. <laughs> Now at hospital, Bill will be admitted so doctors can get to the root of what's causing the pain. In the skies above Mull, Scotland's charity air ambulance is on its way to treat a man who has been injured in a fall. The crew have just found their patient. Now, they have to find a safe place to land. I'll be happy wherever you want to put us at the moment. Yeah, okay. The whole crew helps to scan the landscape, looking for hazards. We're looking to see, to make sure that we can land into a place safely, that we're not going to cause any other third party injury or, uh, or contaminations. We need to make sure that we can land into somewhere around about the sort of the size of two tennis courts is what we're ultimately looking for. Make sure there's no lines, uh, any of the small BT lines or the small power lines that we could get caught out with. Yeah, I think so. Here we go for the road. Uh, right. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's Paramedics safely on the ground, pilot Sean flies straight off to refuel. While JP and Wendy finally get a look at their patient, Ian. And, with the help of the local doctor and ambulance crew on the ground, come up with a treatment plan. Having the knowledge that he'd fallen from such a height, um, there's a lot to consider. We, we want to know whether patient is critically ill or stable and we want to know that quite fast. He was quite cold and he's been lying on the ground for quite a long time so we want to get him covered up and into a better situation than he was when we arrived. There's little more the paramedics can do out here in the open. With these injuries Ian needs to be transferred to the nearest trauma unit in Glasgow. JP calls a 10. He's fallen eight feet. It's a small impalement, um, but we're creating rib fractures, uh, posterior rib fractures. Uh, at the moment, the patient is stable. We're going to load him onto the back mattress, to the ambulance, and then to the secondary landing site. All these injuries are, are potentially serious until we, you know, until we get them to hospital. We haven't got x-ray eyes, so we treat for the worst. So th this is crucial that we've got the air ambulance there that we can then get these patients to, to definitive care. The local ambulance arrived as quickly as possible, but Ian's wife is relieved he'll now be airlifted to the mainland. I don't know what we'd do without this today. I mean, yes, you see, we're pretty isolated. It took a, an hour and a quarter for the ambulance to get here. But now, this is... I'm getting shifted, hopefully, to Glasgow. The weather is turning. JP and Wendy need to move Ian as quickly as possible. It's a risky and painful process. Ian, I don't want you to move at all. I'm just going to come in on to leave. There will be some pain as we move you, but we need to get you moved now. Ready, set, roll. <laughs> We 
we're trying to, to, to minimally move these patients because obviously if you've got fractures, you don't want to be re, you know, causing re-bleeding. Uh, you don't want to, if there's any internal injury, you don't want to be causing any problems with that. So we were very much um, scooping the patient first and then putting them onto a vacuum mattress. It's like a big bean bag, basically. We can suck the air out of and it cocoons the patient quite nicely. Okay. Now that's good. Well done. Everything's got to be done very carefully, well thought through and planned, and the communication between everybody is quite clear before anything happens at that stage. Once we get you on this and get you all cocooned up... Uh, that's a good... Well done. Oh. 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 This up and round. Oh. With Ian secure and stable, he can be safely carried to the helicopter landing site. Brilliant, guys. Well done. OK, and we'll just stop you there. I'll get them all blanketed up. And that's it. So basically, this comes onto here. I'll just click them onto there. Good lads, well done. Put this red bag in the back of here if you want, or... Ready, brace and lift. Good, OK, and then we're going to do just, just straight on. OK, keep going. They'll have a party when you come back, don't worry about that. Yeah, get that onto there. there. Yeah. OK. Flying time to Glasgow is 35 minutes, a journey which by car and ferry takes almost five hours. JP and Wendy have to monitor Ian closely en route. He has injured his ribs and has a nasty puncture wound in his back. We're monitoring um, the patient from the, the moment we get to them and any kind of changes can indicate deterioration and it helps the hospital at the other end because then they've got a picture of what's happened before the patient has arrived there. Luckily for Ian, the weather holds. The air ambulance can make good time. Are you receiving? Over. I just had a Over. We are inbound to you with a CPA of one four two eight. Finally, the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital comes into view, complete with rooftop helipad. One of the good things about Queen Elizabeth is having the helipad on the roof because um, then we would, don't need a secondary transfer, which extends the, the time to get a patient into definitive care. From here, Ian can be taken straight to the emergency department. The guys are super drilled. Wendy was um, would be speaking to the control room to make sure that the uh, that roof pad is open, that the, um, the hospital know, are aware that we're coming in as well, so they have a team ready to receive that patient. Not long after his accident, in one of the country's remotest spots, Ian is receiving state-of-the-art care in Scotland's largest hospital. We can get these patients in half the time of a road ambulance. We can fly direct, which is really good. We don't have to worry about the road network in Scotland. And so it actually gets these patients to the right hospital um, and we can get you know, better outcomes for, the, for these uh, critically injured or ill uh, patients. In Edinburgh, Stephen and Guion are on the night shift. Three double six five from controls. Apologies to divert you onto the Stamper call. It's at Parliament House Hotel. I did have a crew on route to this, but they've been diverted to a red call. Can I confirm the spot on your terminal over? Yeah, that's just you. More than happy to help. Nine nine nine. Right, what have we got this time, Guion? Uh, so we've got a job come through. A sixty-nine year old male uh, with breathing difficulties. So all we've got so far is male with COPD, um, which is a chronic condition, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, and he's breathless. 
this patient's currently at a hotel in the middle of the town centre, so that's, that's all we've got at the minute. Um, so it's hard to know how serious it is. COPD is a general term used um, for uh, lung conditions, so things like emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So it's a long-term condition that people uh, live with, and it's not going to get any better, basically. So it's a very common thing that we deal with, uh, and it can be caused by you know, long-term smoking or people that have been exposed to things like asbestos, um, working in factories, miners, things like that. It's the height of the summer tourist season, when hundreds of thousands of visitors flock to the capital. Inevitably, some will be taken ill. No matter where they are from, the ambulance service is there to help. So it says that there's no uh, previous calls for this patient, which might indicate that he is a tourist, or if it's a guy with COPD, it's likely that we have been called to him in the past if, if he was a local patient, so... Um, this one's a hotel as well, though. It's a hotel, so yeah, probably someone out of town. The Edinburgh Festival is, is massive. It's worldwide famous. Um, so the calls, the calls are coming in. Um, it puts a puts a lot of, a lot of pressure on us. We put on more resources, more ambulances in that time to try and assist with demand. Um, but as it it's it's difficult. Hi there. Well, Hello. What's happened tonight? I got pneumonia a couple of years ago. Right. Okay. And it's damaged the left lung. Right. I flew in the left lung. And from there, it's developed into COPD. Tonight, we've yeah. been out, like my sister and her husband, we've been out for something to eat. We just started coughing and then come in here and was going to go and have a shower. And that mm -hmm. was it. He struggled. He was struggling. Coughing quite a lot recently, is that what you were yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. Cough, and, cough, and then he loses his breath. Then I, I can't breathe. Then I think, oh, I'm going to bow out. I thought I was going to die last night. So, so see tonight, when this has kind of got worse, did it start off with a coughing as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I started coughing in the bar downstairs. And yeah. Then, she said, like, you know, we better go to the room, because it's embarrassing, eh? Mm -hmm. Come to the room and then I'll start coughing. And is it a non-stop coughing fit? Like, it goes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just yeah. a little cough. Yeah, but then it's yeah. like, I, I, I sort my trousers up. Uh-huh. And I... You lost it. I lost he's, it. He's I, just I couldn't. call an ambulance mm. to do, do, and do, do you feel yourself panicking as well? Because obviously this yeah, coughing, that doesn't yeah. help, you see. Do you know I mean, you probably... Respirations goes up, so you're gasping for air more and more as you're panicking. Yeah. And that doesn't help as well. This gentleman, he was up from London. Uh, with his family on a holiday, I think for the festival, um, and he developed shortness of breath. Shortness of breath was a, an exacerbation of the COPD. He seemed quite anxious to begin with. Whatever had happened, I think, had subsided to, to some degree, which is quite good, good to see. Um, Observational-wise, he was relatively stable as well, um, which is good. That situation, I feel you know, like yeah. I'm full now because I'm all right. I'm even breathing all right now. <laughs> I'm even breathing all right now. Mm -hmm. It's important to, to calm them down, um, build that rapport, uh, and getting them to kind of slow their breathing down. Nice, slow, deep breaths always helps. I think that's a lot to do with it. It's kind of reassuring the patient as well. But with patient Peter's cough clearly still affecting him, Guion decides to run some tests. <laughs> Yeah, it does sound really congested. And a lot more on, on the left side. <laughs> Possibly would mean a lot of fluid in the lungs. So it could sound quite grunty or crackly when there's a lot of fluid. But it, it does sound like, you know, you, you've got a chest infection that's brewing up. Whether it's appropriate to go and see a GP as soon as you can, or going up to the hospital, you know. At the moment, you look quite comfortable to me. I know you're coughing away and you are congested, you know what I mean? But he's not at the point where I'm thinking, I'm, I'm worried about his breathing, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm not concerned his oxygen levels are okay right. and he's not, um, you know, gasping for air and his colour's good and he's not using what we call accessory muscles to really try and open his airways up. We look at the clinical, the vital signs, and that's the first thing we do. So we look at um, how much oxygen is saturated in the blood, the respiration rate, so the rate that they're breathing uh, within a minute. You'd be assured, you know, all the checks so far looking good, oxygen levels, blood pressure's fine. Heart rate and rhythm's good, so everything's... It's just listening to your chest and seeing you cough, that, that's enough to tell us that, yeah, there's something brewing, you know? A lot of people that have worked in factories, you know, miners, coal miners, 
um, people that work with asbestos and things like that. They're the, the, your classic COPD patient mm. and people that be smoking as well, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But it's people that have worked in factories and things like that that do tend to have COPD. Yeah. Um, there you go, you know. Yeah. I don't know if you were exposed to anything like that in the past, over the years, or you don't, I don't know. I, don't know. I, mean, well, I, I think probably your lifestyle years, years ago. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, I say, clubs and... Because mm. everyone smoked, didn't you? Even in clubs, you was allowed to smoke. And... Happy that Peter's condition isn't getting worse, paramedics offer him the use of a nebulizer to see if that makes him more comfortable. I don't think a &E admission was appropriate for him during our time there. It was clear to see that he was conversing quite well. He appeared quite well as well, and he wasn't struggling at the time. So I think it was a good option. Do you feel any better than, than what you did when we walk, when we come in here? You do? I, I mean, I'm talking to you okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm breathing. Well, keep breathing, no. Oh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> right, we'll see how you are on your feet. <coughs> oh, we're going to get you to do a few press ups, so I'll maybe leave that. <laughs> <laughs> Start jogging on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> another few, another few wee lines. <laughs> With Peter stable, Guion and Stephen can continue to bring everyone's stress levels down with some chat. It's all part of the job. How long have you been married for? Uh, Too long. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we, I met you in 81 and we got married in 87. Oh, and so, yeah, it's next week, eh? So, oh, it's your birthday next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was something. It's a death sentence, isn't it? <laughs> Okay. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I'm not looking forward to us leaving, Pete. I feel for you. <laughs> we had had a good laugh. I like to think that we made them feel at ease as well. Um, it worked out quite well. So Peter has a history of uh, pneumonia, which is diagnosed in 2014, uh, COPD. Um, With a quick call to a GP, Guion sorts out a prescription to keep Peter stable until he gets back home. Do you watch Fools and Horses? Oh, I used to, yeah. 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 You know, I think he's getting better, eh? Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, and a, uh, yeah, it's nice. Well, yeah. Thank cheers, you. Thanks for yeah. Thanks, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Good luck, guys. Yeah. All right, Thanks okay. Enjoy the rest of the weekend as well. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thanks very much. They agreed to get into a taxi at the end of the night to up to the GP, out of hours GP practice at the hospital to get the medication that was arranged by myself on the phone. Um, so I think that was a perfect kind of result for him. And they were quite happy about that as well. So. He can enjoy the rest of his holiday, knowing that the paramedics are there if he needs them. Ambulance emergency, information breathing. Yes. And are they awake? Yes. <laughs> Also on shift in Edinburgh is specialist paramedic Matt. He's en route to his next job. Please have a nice day, please stand. This is what you're en route to in Dalkeith, it's for a female with chest pain. Um, it's a course that's suggesting a PRE and we'll have no available food within 25 minutes. Uh, yeah, certainly, um, just from the small amount of information, I would say that I don't require backup at this time and definitely uh, wait for uh, my call back before you arrange that over. That's not a problem at all. I'll wait for your update. Thank you. Stop it. Matt is the closest available paramedic. To get to the woman as quickly as possible, he's driving with full lights and sirens. Not that every driver notices. Right, this is always a tricky bit because you've got to drive head on and we'll go down the inside instead. Just ahead, take third exit. But then you can get cut off, the so back. the inside's not always a good idea. Ah, you don't do that! I uh, joined the ambulance service in 2002. Before I joined the ambulance service, I've been a delivery driver of lots of different things. Um, I d delivered flowers for many years for my now wife's florist. I've delivered pizzas for Domino's and Perfect Pizza, delivered everything I've been driving since I was 17. Um, I wanted to stick with driving jobs, but I wanted something a little bit more challenging.
Pushing through the traffic, Matt prepares for the job ahead. From the call, he doesn't have much to go on. Very difficult to tell. It's, uh, how can anyone ever really diagnose over the phone? It depends very much on the answers that the um, patient or the call maker, uh, how they answer the questions. So to the lay person, I suppose a chest pain, the worst case scenario is a heart attack maybe, or a pulmonary embolism, a PE. Um, whether you can rule those out over the phone, I, um, I don't know. So that's why you send an emergency ambulance. Excellent. This is us. Unlike regular paramedics, as a specialist, Matt often works alone. He carries a range of equipment, specifically designed for cardiac emergencies. But until he sets eyes on the patient, there's no way of knowing if the problem is heart-related or not. Hello. I had sort of chest pain and I felt as if I wanted to be, I felt sick. Uh -huh. I had sort of bad indigestion and wanted to be sick. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the sickness came on and I went to be sick. Um, and then since then I've been sick a few times and I'm short of breath and this pain in my chest as well. And I'm feeling a bit dizzy. Okay. And if you could score the pain out of 10, what would you score it? Five. Five, so it's really pretty uncomfortable. Yeah. You'd pretty much, you'd prefer to do without it, yeah, but I it's really not unbearable. It, yeah. And does the pain discomfort travel anywhere else, like through to your back or down your arms or into your jaw or anything? No, not that I've noticed. No. So obviously we're going down the, um, a, a lot of these questions are to rule out any cardiac problems. Yeah. It's, well, it's probably what you're thinking as well. I can yeah. tell by your anxiety yeah. that you're thinking, I'm having a heart attack here. Safe than so on. And, um, and there are definitely some things a bit that sound, you know, like it could be cardiac, but that's definitely not to say that it's a heart, heart attack. No. Your colour is good. Um, I feel a bit flushed, actually. I feel you like look flushed. Hot. Yeah, which is, isn't normal for someone having a heart attack. Right. They would tend to be a, a grey, grey and sweaty, whereas you're very much, very much flushed. Um, also, sort of regardless what these tests show, because of the I can't completely rule out any cardiac problems. I am going to um, arrange for an ambulance to get you in to the hospital. Uh, 3793 receiving, if you could arrange a category two response uh, for to take this patient into the Royal Infirmary, please, over. Yes, of course, that's not a problem at all. I'll arrange a level two backup. I'm not sure if available at the moment, but I will get you someone as soon as I can. If the level of response changes at all, just give me a call back in. Uh, no problem. While he waits for the ambulance, Matt continues to monitor Liz for any changes in her condition. How's the discomfort? Is it the same? The pain's still just the same. But the breathing, I don't feel as if I'm gasping as yeah. much as I was, so maybe I'm just a wee bit more relaxed. Well, since <coughs> when, when I came, you thought you were having heart problems, yeah. and now, I've probably put you a little bit at yeah. ease that you're not, yeah. so I would hope that there's a little bit less worry, which would help the breathing. You always hear of these people that are, well, fairly young for having a heart attack. And yeah, just like, definitely. You just worry if this is your last day. <laughs> you know, I'm on the way out, I'm checking out a bit soon. I've got a lot of living to do yet, I'm ready to check out. I think the official uh, term that we use is the fear of impending doom. Right. It's the, one of the signs of uh, a heart attack. So we, so you can tell the look on the person's face when you walk through the door. Yeah. Um, well, it's true because you just think, oh, I've got so much, so much <laughs> living to do. I'm yeah. ready to go. Yeah. yeah well, at least 30, 40 years to go. Yeah, well, not in my shift. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Right. A big part of the paramedic's job is judging when it's appropriate for a patient to be taken to hospital. Cast iron guarantee. Sure. As Liz's symptoms are beginning to ease, could it be time for Matt to rethink? Ambulance emergency. Is the patient breathing? Yeah, he's fine. He's just awake. He's awake. Okay, yeah, tell yeah, me yeah. exactly what's happened. So uh, we were going on a cycle, and mm -hmm. he just got the his ankle got caught in the chain. It just teared quite a bit through his ankle. Right. En route to the injured cyclist are Paisley ambulance crew Pete and Gary. So we're going to have a 25-year-old male that's caught his ankle in his bike chain. He's not falling off his bike, just got his ankle caught. The patient is somewhere on a cycle path nearby. 
locate them could be an issue. So there's a cycle track that goes from Johnson all the way to Bridge Weir up to Tickham. It's a long cycle track and we've, I've had a few calls there before for various things. Obviously we've been a cycle track. This um, is a tarmac it'll though. Be too, it'll be too narrow for the ambulance to get down. Um, so anything we do, we'll need to take all the equipment with us. Unsure of the patient's exact location, the crew make a split-second decision as to where to access the track. Cycle track. From Morrison's, where does it go? It goes straight across the road from Morrison's, doesn't it? Up at Farm Road, is that a cycle track? There's different bits where it comes quite close to the road eh, and then it disappears um, into the woods or in the countryside for a, wee, for a few miles. So it's quite important to know where, where's your closest eh, point of access. It's the right call. As Gary and Pete approach the bike track, there's signs of an incident. Some bystanders there. Puppies. Right to the side uh, there, right? Yeah. It was actually, we're really fortunate he was where he was at the side of the road, because that goes on for miles. Across an island and I changed gear, and it just the chain came off, and my, well, I think my food just went straight down. I didn't feel that actually happened until I looked back down again. It's not wrapped out, it's just, it's, cause that, it's, it's, just kind of the spokes there went in. Yeah, it, yeah. I imagine my foot just slipped me straight into this. Let's have a wee look at it. So we, thought we didn't know if we could walk or cycle. Yeah, back, no, so absolutely. Not, I know the hospital's not far. Just going to take your shoe off first and foremost. These two friends had not long set off on a long bike ride when the accident happened. Yeah, that kind of wee kind of cog mechanism there. Yeah, we just had stopped for a wee break and we we're coming across, went to come across, uh, just come down the route, went across the road and I just turned around and um, I think he just changed gear and then Obviously he's not wearing anything on this side of the shoe and the chain just got absolutely cut away at his ankle. And then I just turned around and he's like, I'm in a bit of pain, sat down, I think I saw a bit of bone and stuff. I'm just going to take a sock off my friend, alright? You feel me doing that? Yeah. You will wiggle your toes? Okay, stop now. In this case, bones and tendons appear to have been spared, but a wound this deep needs further assessment. Yeah. So we'll, go, we'll get it cleaned up a wee bit and put a dressing on it, but you probably will need a couple of stitches. It was, it was a fairly severe um, laceration. Um, fortunately, there wasn't a lot of blood loss involved in it, and it was more or less just a case of coming and getting them in the ambulance and, and cleaning the wound. Yeah. You just stand your good leg, we'll get you onto the stretcher. Could you All do right. us a favour? Yeah, uh, fair sure. thing. Could you just support his yeah, ankle? Man, absolutely. Um, just there, is that Just okay? one either side, just right, yeah. right on his heel, one, one right. here and one on his heel. Okay, All if right. you just keep it up off the okay. ground, okay? We're just going to go and get a stretcher. No we'll be back in two seconds, How okay? How much pain are you in, Gregor? You're none at all. It's a pure hard man. Well, it's tingling a little bit, but it's not, yeah. not pain. We can give you some pain relief, all right? Aye, sweet, that's fine. I'm not in them pain, don't you take it? You don't have to take it. <laughs> You're laughing, Gus? Yeah. Aye, <laughs> moan. Can I give it in a minute? Take some. I'm all right, I'm all right. right that's yeah. fine. Listen, don't, all we're saying is don't sit and struggle. You don't get a sticker for nah, not getting pain relief, all right? <laughs> but we'll get you on there. We'll kind of put a bandage up, just cover it up. He didn't want anything in the way of pain relief. I don't know whether he totally trusted us or not, but <laughs> yeah, no, he was quite happy um, just to sit. Um, on the, on the stretcher. I think he was mortified because his friend took endless selfies and photographs um, for um, Instagram. So I don't think he was enjoying that too much. Nah, it's a pure hard man, isn't he? Actually getting a stretcher, that's the <laughs> <laughs> Oh, mate. I'm going to get a photo of that. No, no need National TV, it, baby. Take a photo of Yeah, you know, this is going to all go over so Right, here, I'll take that. Yeah. All right, do you want to take us? Um, all right, good man. Okay. In Dalkeith, near Edinburgh, specialist paramedic Matt is treating Liz, who has been suffering from breathing difficulties and chest pain. Her symptoms seem to be subsiding, so Matt needs to decide if she still needs to go to hospital. There's another option, yes. other than hospital, that I can offer you as well, which would be um, that you don't go to hospital and that I um, would contact your GP, discuss the case with the GP and then leave you at home. But that obviously does have a certain amount of risk to it, is that I might, I might be wrong, that it might not. I mean, it's really everything, the whole story, the whole pattern, every test that I'm doing, your history, your presentation, everything is speaking to me of, is telling me that you've got indigestion. 
if if you if you're sure or you think it is just indigestion, I, I don't feel the need that I have to go to a hospital. I'm pretty close to sure. Right. I could discuss it with your GP, um, but I think the GP would probably have similar concerns to myself uh -huh. regarding your uh, you know your patient group type and the pain. Is that yep. the one way to rule it out is the blood tests? This thing has definitely settled. I can feel that myself. Yeah. I do, I do feel better, to be honest. OK. Matt calls Lizzie's GP to see if she is happy for her to remain at home. Thanks very much for your help. Cheers, see ya. It's almost certain that she is having digestive problem, indigestion, heartburn, something like that. But because of the patient group that she's in, her age, her family history, the doctor is in agreement that she probably should go into hospital. So now it's a question of how, how to get her in. So the decision is made. Liz will go to hospital. Cheers, see ya. It's the safest decision for the patient. Back on the bike path near Paisley, injured cyclist Gregor is still refusing pain relief, despite having a nasty wound. But you know, that's not an unusual thing. See, we we got a lot of kind of car accidents, a lot of kind of people falling, trauma, you know, breaking the bones, etc. And it's not unusual for for people not to experience pain immediately. And I think, like you, you were saying, you get the adrenaline. And it's all I'm going to do is just kind of clean the wound. There you go, all right. Just going to got a lot of kind of dirt, so we're going to just irrigate it. Then we're going to just put a dressing on it just for the infection control more than anything else. All right. It's not active. You might feel a wee sting here. See if you're getting in pain. Let us know. All right. And I mean that. You know. Listen, yeah. I know it's it's a laugh and a joke, your pals. But don't. All we're saying is. All we're saying is don't sit and suffer. All right. I'm just kind of irrigating the wound, guy. I'm just going to kind of cover it up a wee bit. I'm just going to get a wee gauze. Something like that. Yeah. Right. We're just going to give it a clean. I think it's just definitely more like a flesh injury. I don't think there's any kind of broken bones. Uh, you know, you've got a pulse distal to the end, you can move, mm. you can feel everything, so... So what we'll do, I know you don't want any gas in here. Mm. Uh, Tonight we'll give you a couple of paracetamol. So hopefully it'll take some of the pain before you do start feeling it. I'll set you up a wee bit. There you go, how's that? <sighs> Greg, all the checks we've done on you are absolutely fine. All with the normal parameters. Injury to your, to your ankle there. I think you probably do well need a stitch. There's over a joint. Yeah. All right, so we'll take you up the hospital just to get that seen to But we've cleaned it, and as I said, just put a band on just to protect the wound, just to, to keep it clean. All right. Uh, I've got no other injuries, and as I said, we'll, we'll just get you up the road. All right, have you got any questions about him? Are you all right? OK. Wound dressed and Gregor's vitals checked, Gary and Pete make the onward journey to A&E. What was your plan for the day? Just do cycle to Hillport, mate, and then round it, and then back. And I'm ambition of mine is just go and see Scotland, some of the islands, you know. Because some of them, I went to Shetland a few years ago and I didn't really know what to expect and I went there and it is like a hidden gem, you know, white sand, blue beat, you know. It's a different way of life as well. Everybody's laid back, relaxed, there was no stress, it was just brilliant and I thought I really want to come back here. It's one of them calls where not necessarily life threatening. Um, so you've got that time to just talk to people, get to know them. You can uh, just find out about his, his story. I love finding out people's stories. Good laughing, all right. Yeah, I think you could, you'd get on that and take that to Melport. Huh? I'll take you around Melport, no problem. Huh? Hello, ambulance service. Is the patient breathing? It's very difficult to breathe here. It is very unconscious, you know. Please, if you could land quickly. Okay. Receiving, go ahead, please. In Edinburgh, specialist paramedic Matt is nearing the end of a busy day shift. He's got um, a 11-year-old male. Uh, he has a brain tumour and he's experiencing some difficult pain breathing over. Aye, uh, that's received. He'll be there in the next few minutes. Calls about breathing difficulties are usually given high priority, as they can be life-threatening. I would have been allocated to that as uh, immediately life-threatening. That if he was uh, having extreme respiratory difficulties, then I would be able to um, assist that and help. 
Due to the nature of the emergency, an ambulance is immediately dispatched. Quite often go by the parents' leads on jobs like this, not with a fairly like Just what ahead. sounds like a potentially life limiting chronic problem. Mum or dad a lot of worry you have been through the NHS rigmarole many times and will know what he needs and when he needs it. So family live in a block of flats just south of the city centre. What Dad described just doesn't sound like a, uh, a typical seizure, but that's not to say that it wasn't some form of seizure activity. Because yesterday we took him to the a &E because the son was not his seizure attack yesterday. OK. So this, uh, uh, just, you know, 10 minutes. He Did he have a seizure again today? Yeah. Like, you know, funny feelings, yeah, and uh -huh. also in the ear. Okay. Uh, funny feeling in the ear. Yeah. And also uh, vibrating here in the mouth. Okay. This is kind of seizure, you know. Hi, Hussein. I'm Martin. This is Kevin. Is it Hussein? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, Hussein. Yeah. Um, I was just getting, I'm, I'm two minutes ahead of you, and I was getting a story from Dad. He's been getting treatment for a brain tumour ward to the sick kids. Okay. Um, he recently had some seizure activity and was yeah. in the hospital that, yesterday. Yesterday. And all of a sudden, you know, he was just... Can't breathe properly. And how do you feel just now, Hussein? Just Not good. Are you sore anywhere? Yeah, it's in your chest. And are you finding it difficult to breathe? Okay. Was he making noise at the time? Yes, yes. Sort of like yeah, he's choking like... Choking, <coughs> co choking like, noises. Yes. Said, uh, please call the ambulance quickly. Yeah. Only, I, can't, I can't imagine what that's like for, for all of you. As a paramedic, you get a, a, a small short glimpse of uh, of a patient's, uh, a patient's and their family's life, maybe 10 or, or 20 minutes you might spend with them. Um, and in that time, you get to see them at a particularly low ebb or something significant happening, something life-changing to them. Just look exhausted. The throat, you know, it's like, this is new thing for us. Yeah. So it's like choking, you know. Without seeing it happening, it's difficult to see. Um, when you, if you try and take a big deep breath, can you do that? Take a really big deep breath for me. Brilliant. Does that make it feel worse when you do that? No. Okay, and is it difficult to take a deep breath? Do you find that that's difficult because of the feeling in your chest? Was there a loss of consciousness, a loss of awareness during the during seizure? The, yeah, it's the one yesterday. Awareness, yeah. And conscious. today? Today is unconscious. Today? There was... Yeah, when he's joking, he was, he don't know where he is. No. Okay. So we were very... No eye contact? No, no, he's what just like, I put him here for to lie down, but he don't know yeah. where okay. he need to go. So it's very different, different kind of thing. Yes, different, yeah. Definitely one for the specialists at the yeah. Sick Children's Hospital. So Kevin's away to get a chair, and we'll help you down to the ambulance and we'll hopefully get some uh, some better answers from the hospital. They might be able to better answer some of your questions. Here. And here is a chair. Kevin's got a chair. Yes. Okay. Oh, Shimmy your bottom all the way back. The ambulance crew will now take Hussein to A&E at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children. For Matt, it's back to his shift. It's, uh, it sounds uh, like quite a heartbreaking medical case that the, the family have got to deal with. You'll never find out a really small amount of what life must be like for these folks and what the ongoing treatment plans are. Going forward from now as well, it must just be uh, must be really really hard for them. And putting myself into those shoes, into their shoes, was quite uh, 
quite upsetting. In Paisley, it's mid-afternoon. Paramedic Gary and technician Pete are moving on to their second job of the day. We're on, we're off to a, a, an elderly female patient, a 92-year-old, um, who has a respiratory tract infection. Um, according to the notes from the GP, her oxygen saturation levels are fairly low. Um, this um, makes up probably about a quarter of the work we get uh, on, a, on an average day shift. Um, just breathing problems. Um, elderly patients in general probably make up about 50% of the work we do during the day. Right. Let's go and say hello, Gary. Patient Agnes is up and alert, but her breathing is a concern. So how's things normal with your chest? Do you have any problems with your breathing? I'm not, I can't see, because right. I've got very bad macular degeneration. I see. Right. But everything else, I'm perfectly You're as fit as a fiddle. Long, long as in heart. Uh -huh. I'm doing any of that. So this is very strange then, it's all out of the blue then? Well, it's a bit out of, uh -huh. it's very much out of blue. Right, we'll have a wee look. Okay, now that's going to squeeze your arm just for a couple of seconds. We'll do Agnes, we'll just give you a little bit of oxygen just to help your breathing, okay? With their best bedside manner, Pete and Gary reassure Agnes while they run some tests. And it turns out she's no stranger to this kind of thing. How about you? Where did you do your nursing? Oh. Right. Did you work in the wards? Yeah. When did you retire? 32 years. 32 years. 32 years ago. And strangely enough. Do you miss it though? Do you miss the work? Oh, I miss the work. You know, the funny thing is, I can still meet people. And they remember me. Seemingly there's something in your eyes. And a lot of you just, my eyes have shut to me as well. They recognise you. They recognise me. And one, one, one person said, it's just as sometimes there's always a, some people have a, a face you don't mm. forget. Well, that's true. I mean, some, especially sometimes when you're, you're dealing with patients, it's the worst moment of their lives. So it's, it's understandable they recognise you sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I sometimes, even I'm shopping in Asda, somebody will come up and say to me, oh, you looked after my dad, or you looked after me, yeah. or my mum. You know, some of the sickest people we meet, or some, some of the, the happiest some of the people cheeriest, you ever meet, you know? They just, they just got on my life, you know? And some people just adapt. Tests complete, Gary can make a decision about Agnes's treatment. It's a slight abnormality in ECG, but we're not concerned about that, OK? Mm -hmm. So I think the best thing we can do is just, we'll get you a little chair in here, we'll take you to the ambulance and we'll get you up the hospital. The, the good news is it's, it's nothing that can't be fixed. You know, a few antibiotics, a bit of oxygen, a bit of, you know, putting your feet up, you'll be fine. You just need some TLC. Whoops. <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah. yeah just so just turn to the side. Feet. All right. Okay. Turn around. We'll get that meat yeah, Just watch. There's no arms in this. Okay, there we go. Well done. Fantastic. There you go. You just hold that in. Thank you. All right. Are you okay? Just to make sure you... I know it feels a little strange, there's no sides, but we have got you. All right, you won't fall. <laughs> okay, this wee chair's on wheels. All right, it feels a wee bit wobbly, but you'll be absolutely fine. I'll be, I'll be safe. Okay. I'm not very heavy. <laughs> we'll, we'll be the judge of that. <laughs> We've had our weight of bags. I will lock up and I'll lock them up. Lovely, thank you. Agnes's friend Nancy can rest assured she's in good hands, even if she can sometimes be a reluctant patient. She's great, absolutely great, and she was determined. She, no doctors, no. They wanted to phone 111. No, no, no. Very strong willed. That's what keeps her going because her eyesight's poor, you know, but oh, she's wonderful. Yeah, she's 92. 
ذلك التسميه So how long were you a nurse for? Was it a long time? No, I was, I was, I didn't know nurse. I was a nurse. Ah, right. Although they're always treated just the same as the staff nurses now. I loved it, I loved it. I've got to be honest, Agnes, I, I, I genuinely, I love the job as well, you know. It's a humbling job, you know, I've always think I've got problems in life, you know, like, you know, kids wrecking the house, credit card bills, things like that, you know. You go see somebody that's, you know, having a stroke, a heart attack, dying of cancer, it really kind of puts things into perspective and also makes you appreciate how fortunate you've been in life. Next time, the paramedics head to the hills to rescue a hiker. Tell you what, but there's worse places to wait for an ambulance, eh? And hunt for a missing patient in Aberdeen. Yeah, we've arrived out uh, on scene here and the patient has absconded. And an old sailor takes the scenic route to hospital.